Good evening. I'm Allison Schilling, Senior Program Officer here at the Concord Museum. And I'm pleased this evening to introduce Camille Johnson, a student in the Masters of Arts Museum Studies in the Cooperstown Graduate Program at SUNY College at Oneana. And the second Thomas Dugan intern in public history here at the Concord Museum in Robbins House. And she will provide the introduction to this evening's program. Let me also note that we invite you to submit questions during the forum via the chat on YouTube. I will come back on the screen towards the end of the program to facilitate those questions with our speakers. Thank you to our partners here in Concord at the Robbins House for co-sponsoring not only tonight's forum, but our ongoing partnership through the Dugan Internship. I hope you all enjoy the program and I'll turn it over to Camille. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the Concord Museum and the Robbins House for the incredible experience that I had this summer as the second Thomas Dugan intern in public history. And, at, you know, as a culminating moment in my internship, I am so honored to introduce tonight's speakers. First, the Volia Glimp is the Peabody Family Distinguished Professor of History at Duke University. Her scholarly work focuses on slavery, emancipation, plantation societies, women's history, and the era of reconstruction. This evening, she will discuss her most recent book, The Women's Fight, The Civil War's Battles for Home, Freedom, and Nation, which has won awards from the American Historical Association, the Southern Association for Women Historians, the Society for Civil War Historians, and the Organization of American Historians. In this broadly conceived book, Professor Glimpf provides a comprehensive new history of women's roles and lives in the Civil War, North and South, white and black, slave and free, showing how women were essentially and fully engaged in all three arenas. In its pages, we consider women as they stood their ground, moved into each other's territory, sought and found common ground and fought for vastly different principles. Some women used all the tools and powers they could muster to prevent the radical transformations the war increasingly imposed. Some fought with equal might for the same transformations and other women fought simply to keep the war at bay as they waited for their husbands and sons to return home. As one reviewer has written, Glimp's study complicates and adds nuance to our picture of women's wartime struggles. The obstacles they faced were as multifaceted and individual as their personalities. Glimp has surpassed previous historians in bringing the individual experiences, contributions and views of her female subjects, elite and poor, black and white, northern and southern to light. Our moderator this evening is Jacqueline Jones, Professor Emer Emerita from the University of Texas. Professor Jones is the author of several books, including Labor of Love, Labor of Sorrow, Black Women Work in the Family from Slavery to the Present, which was a finalist in the Pulitzer Prize and won the Banf Bancroft Prize in the year it was published. She has won numerous grants and awards, including a MacArthur, Fe MacArthur Fellowship from 1999 to 2004. She served as vice president for the professional division of the American Historical Association from 2011 to 2014. Her current project is a study of the African-American community in Boston during the Civil War era. Professor Jones is a past president of the American Historical Association and Professor Glimpf was elected this summer as president-elect and will begin her term in January. On behalf of my colleagues at the Concord Museum and the Robbins House, I thank all of you for joining us this evening. Like you, I am looking forward to listening to and learning from this conversation with Thavolia Glimpf and Jacqueline Jones. And now I actually cede the floor to them. Thank you, Camille, for that nice introduction. And um, I should just say that Thavolia and I are going to have a conversation about her book. Before we start that though, uh, again, Thavolia, congratulations on being elected president-elect of the American Historical Association. You. you know, the history profession is facing multiple challenges these days, and um, we're very lucky uh, to be able to look forward to your tenure in the position. So again, congratulations. Um, and I just want to echo to Camille's uh, words about uh, your book, The Women's Fight, The Civil War's Battles for Home, Freedom, and Nation. And uh, right side up. Oh, you can see that, right? <laughs> My copy. 
Um, you know, this is such a wonderful kaleidoscopic view of women during the Civil War. As you look at different groups of women in the North and South, you bring racial and gender ideologies to the fore of our study of the war, and you clearly show the integral roles of women, both as actors, as agents in their own right, and as victims of the war. Um, you know, and your book is such a tour de force in terms of archival research. It's really impressive, and I can only imagine the time and effort you spent uh, deciphering handwriting and piecing together uh, bits of letters and so forth. So uh, it, it is really impressive on uh, so many levels. Uh, just by way of introduction, too, I want to remind our listeners that the Civil War claimed uh, 750,000 lives. And I think that's the figure you use to the volia. Is it 700, 750? Well, I, yeah, I, I think I use that figure, but I'm also, um, I also think it's much, much higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, traditionally it was 600,000, 620, and those were battlefield casualties or fatalities. And also um, soldiers who died of disease or from accidents. And I think now we've begun to add into civilian casualties and also those many enslaved laborers forced to work on Confederate fortifications who later succumbed to diseases uh, or were uh, or died um, accident from accidents. So, but just to put this in perspective, so 750,000 lives. In a country with 21 million people, um, 12, uh, 12 million in the north, 9 million in the south. Um, and I think I have this right. Anyway, it's it's a tremendous percentage of the the uh, population, uh, and and far exceeded the amount of deaths in all other American wars combined, that is uh, all other American deaths in wars combined. So this was, this was really a cataclysm of immense proportions. And I think sometimes we forget um, the tremendous toll it took. Um, so I wanted to begin by saying that, uh, you know, the, uh, the Confederacy was, um, rife with irony. One of the ironies was that um, states' rights were paramount, states' rights in order to preserve the institution of slavery, and yet in order to fight a war, uh, the South had to mobilize and centralize, which was uh, sort of a betrayal of its founding principles in a sense. And also the war um, Southerners, uh, white Southerners kind of mobilized on the idea that they were gonna protect their wives and children at home. They were, they were going to um, protect them from uh, Yankee aggression, this Yankee incursion. When in fact, of course, uh, white men left their homes, leaving their women and children um, to fend for themselves, essentially. And you begin the, the really great chapter uh, on domestic sanctuaries on the run. Domestic sanctuaries on the run. And um, will you talk a little bit about how these uh, white women, uh, especially white women of means in the South, but also impoverished women, how the war affected them so directly and so immediately and so quickly. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. And um, also I'd like to take just a minute to thank uh, Tom Putnam who invited me initially and who has since retired, um, uh, the museum in general um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Camille for the wonderful uh, introduction. And also thank you, Alison Schilling for uh, making sure that we're all here uh, on time and um, for the production. So, um, and Jacqueline, uh, thank you so much for um, agreeing to be in conversation with me about this book. Um, you're one of my heroes, um, yeah. uh, not only as a former president of the American Historical Association, I hope to be in conversation with you about that, 
um, but also for your work on African American women. Um, your your book, um, 1985, Labor of Love. I I it was so instrumental in, in um, defining my trajectory as a historian. So thank you. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> uh, in terms of um, how I thought about um, the question of the role, the place of Southern homes, um, the, the, the house or the home more, in, uh, more particularly has long been of interest to me. Um, and the idea of domestic sanctuaries, um, especially of interest to me um, and other historians as well. For me, uh, thinking about the South, it was always clear as I became, as I grew as a historian, that the notion of, of domestic sanctuaries applied only to some homes, to some people. Um, and some people were not expected to have domestic sanctuaries. And that included enslaved women or enslaved people. And it also included um, a poor white people. Um, so this notion of domestic sanctuaries was one that the South or the Confederacy embraced um, um, in its um, conversations about why um, the South should go to war and why um, uh, uh, Northerners were enemies. And so I wanted to, to think a lot about that idea of domestic sanctuaries. Um, and so I begin the book with a kind of critique of domestic sanctuaries, um, a kind of review of what they were and what they were not and what they could not be in a time of war. And as you point out, you know, ironies abound whenever we talk about anything about the Confederacy. Um, and many of these ironies were actually set in motion by the very ideas that led to secession, right? Um, so the crisis on the home front, um, I, of course, am not the first historian to talk about the home front and the crisis on the home front. I mean, that was a given, but, it was a, but what I wanted to do was to say, not only that there was a crisis as many others have said, but also to think about it as a given, um, to, to, to understand or, or, um, and let my readers come on this journey with me, that white Southerners, particularly those who led um, the movement for secession, uh, particularly enslavers understood well enough that there were you know, numerous ironies in what they were doing, what they were trying to do. And I think I wanted to show that they were always concerned about these ironies, but they became particularly concerned uh, with war. And that concern we see baked really into Confederate law. I mean, the idea that a white man needed to be present on um, a plantation of a certain size, for example. And that notion that protect it was, it was to protect the, the plantation household, to protect a particular a domestic sanctuary. And it would trigger a rebellion on the part of poor white people until it was uh, uh, removed um, as a law in the South. So it's not surprising um, to historians that there was a crisis on the home front. Um, and that crisis included the collapse of white households. I think what I found um, uh, interesting was that we think about the collapse of the um, white households, white households, I'm sorry, as something particular to a peculiar to wealthy white house, house, households, I'm sorry. But I always also wanted to show that poor people also had households and that the war led to a collapse of their homes as well. Um, and that this crisis, no matter whether it was coming from wealthy uh, households or poor white households or from African-Americans or enslaved people, it affected morale on the battlefront. And, and, and it led therefore to military leaders and political leaders uh, to led them to stress um, how important it was for women to not send sad letters to yeah. <laughs> um, to be 
upbeat, no matter how awful your situation was at home. Don't tell your husband, don't tell your boyfriend, don't tell your father that it's bad. Um, and, and that story, of course, is deeply embedded in the historiography of the South, um, uh, of the war. But I wanted to tell it a bit differently and, and to, put, to put women in contact um, with each other in a way that um, was not um, prevalent in the, um, in, in the historiography because we don't have, we never had a situation where white women who were wealthy lived in a bubble, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the war uh, made sort of made it even more necessary um, that they uh, come into each other's worlds. And so I wanted to think about what that um, looked like and um, fortunately, the archive was um, uh, generous in helping me to see uh, what contact looked like. Um, just before we go on, I wanted to correct my own figures here. Population of the North, 21 million. <laughs> population of the South, about nine or 10 million in 1860. So a, a popula total population of 30 million there. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, this very evocative image, domestic sanctuaries on the run, you know, because um, we think of uh, uh, runaways <laughs> and you present pictures of um, white women now having to take to the road with their children in tow, um, fleeing, uh, you know, the Yankees. And it's, um, you know, it signals too for uh, elite women, the economy and the um, in certain areas of the South, at least, the uh, disintegration of plantation discipline. Um, and you talk about uh, uh, white women who remain on the plantation having, for the first time, to kind of negotiate with their enslaved workers during the conflict. Do you want to talk about how, what that meant and, and what the significance of those negotiations were? Sure. So um, the, we know that white women who owned uh, enslaved people and enslaved people, particularly women who worked in the household, we know that there were always um, contests, there were always uh, you know, ne negotiations between them. But we have very little, you know, insight into those negotiations. Some of them we just assume. But what the war does is that it opens up that world to us. We can see um, uh, the evidence of negotiations, and then we can also begin to better understand what took place before the war. So when when white women are trying, not only on the plantation, but those who are running, when they're trying to convince, like. And the one woman I talked about was on the run and she wants to reconstitute her household um, in exile. And she wants a particular black woman to come and be with her as she does that work or to do that work for her. Um, and this woman isn't interested in joining her. And so she sends messages. Um, she sends relatives to convince this woman to come. She um, tries to entice her uh, by saying like, look, if you come with me, um, I'm going to let you, you know, even be with your husband and your children. Um, we have this little cabin that looks up really nice for you. So when she's negotiating in this manner, saying that, you know, you could be with your husband, you could have a nice little hut. Um, what it tells us is that she was accustomed to negotiation, that she knew exactly what the enslaved woman valued. It would, you know, it's my argument. She knew that this enslaved woman valued her family and wanted to be with her family and that freedom for her might look like being with her family, but for the enslaved woman, this offer, this enticement didn't look like freedom to her. It just looked like her being still enslaved. And so it was better for her to not go, better for her to stay in the place that her mistress had fled. And so we see a lot of that sort of um, negotiations taking place as elite women try to figure out 
how to build a domestic sanctuary in an unfamiliar place, in unfamiliar spaces. If you have to run from Texas to the uh, back country of North Carolina, what does that look like? Who do you bring with you? Who do you encounter on the way? And what do the people um, in the communities that you run through, what do they have to say about your coming? So I was interested in, in thinking about the way in which people actually live their lives and um, including, um, as you say, um, enslaved women negotiating with uh, uh, white women who were enslavers and, and what they were trying to do, each with their own vision of what freedom should look like. And I will just add um, that your this work really does flow beautifully from your previous book, um, Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household, which is a, a wonderful study of the plantation as uh, a place where things were made, crops were grown and textiles were <laughs> created, um, but also um, a, a site of tremendous conflict uh, and violence on the part of white women toward enslaved workers. So. Um, as you point out, that process of negotiation um, it, that happens during the war is not new, but it does take on a new dimension, certainly, um, during the conflict. So, um, you know, following on this line of ironies of the war, um, the Confederates claimed, or Confederate leaders claimed, that whiteness bound together um, all white people in the South, regardless of their class status. So even if they were a tenant farmer, they had something in common with the wealthiest planter because they were white. But your book, uh, it does a wonderful job of showing how these class conflicts affected women. And um, as, at, I mean, you give examples of, of elite women uh, resisting aiding their impoverished neighbors, uh, even women and children, calling them, uh, one woman, members of a cowardly race. Um, and, you know, this while non-slaveholding men were bearing the brunt of the fighting. So it, it seems bizarre that these elite women couldn't appreciate the sacrifices of poor white women. Um, so, did you find any um, any sense that these well-to-do women really appreciated what their impoverished counterparts were going? Not much. Tension during war, which should have been presumably bringing people to these white people together. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I did not find. Uh, much of a sense in the part of elite women uh, of sisterhood or um, of bonding on the basis of race, right? Uh, and I think this is not really surprising. Um, what was surprising to me was how deep the hatred seemed to be, um, how much um, elite women seemed to um, see poor white women as, as you know, as I um, quote one of them in the book, as, you know, as people of a different race even. And it seems counterintuitive, as you point out, um, given the, um, the fact that the vast majority of men in the Confederate army were not slaveholders, right? And so you would think that slaveholders would want to you know, be nice, <laughs> and, um, right, you know, right. You know, like recognize how much, how dependent upon them they were. And I think initially, if, you, if like the Confederacy, if you say to all white people in the South, look, we're going to defend your homes. Um, we think all of your homes are sanctuaries and poor white women go like, oh, and poor white women, oh, that's, that's cool. Um, but they quickly um, come to understand that no, nothing has changed. Um, our households are not considered sanctuaries. We, um, poor white people, are treated horribly still and even more horribly now uh, during the war. So when, when, as other historians 
like Stephanie McCurry, you know, she only white, what poor white women, you know, took to the streets for bread. Um, they were ridiculed um, instead of people saying, well, my goodness, we need to do more to feed them. Not that there were not any efforts to feed poor white people, but they seemed to generate um, resentment rather than um, a kind of sympathy for, right. you know, for these people and for the sacrifices they were made. I was really astounded um, mm -hmm. on how poorly they were thought of by elite um, white people. And I, I say astounded, but when, as a historian, of course, and, and, and you know this as well, when you think back to the pre-war South, it, of course, I should not have been so surprised, but I think the level of the, the hatred was um, surprising to me. Just again, to show you know the stresses of war um, and how those stresses fractured <laughs> Southern white society, which um, had to fight a war, uh, and that certainly affected morale and, and the progress of the war. Um, so, Thavoli, you do a great job, too, of um, describing the experiences of enslaved women. And, and they, there wasn't one experience, obviously, um, but uh, these were women who were simultaneously kind of agents of subversion <laughs> uh, to the Confederacy, to the plantation system, and yet victims as well. Um, victims of the war, of the shortages, of uh, the collapse of um, agriculture. So um, would you talk just a little bit about um, Enslaved women, um, and again, this the spectrum of experience that you you found. I I I knew this going into this project, but I I didn't understand um, the complexity of it necessarily, um, or how um, much the problem reverberated throughout the South and became a political issue. So in essence, um, what I argue in the book is that enslaved women were the least considered of the combatants and non-combatants. Um, no one, North or South, envisioned them as agents, envisioned them as political thinkers, envisioned them as people who might take up arms or who might, by just running away, make life different or difficult for both armies. Mm -hmm. uh, so enslaved women, by making themselves a problem, not intending to make themselves a problem, their intention was to gain their freedom. And for them, it made sense that um, a Union army fighting their enemy must be, as we say, their friend. It made sense that um, if they were going to run away, this was the opportune moment. They could run to Union lines. And of course, Union lines were not expecting them, um, did not welcome them, but their persistence, their refusal to go back, you know, even they were forced back in uh, many, many times, but they kept coming. And their refusal to stay in place, to stay where Lincoln and others thought they should stay, made them a problem that had to be resolved. And so the Union and the, the uh, federal government had to do something. And so then we see uh, these uh, refugee camps, you know, being um, set up, these plantations um, being sort of managed by the federal government, which uh, put Black women to work. Um, but theirs is, um, for, for a, a group of people who are the least considered um, initially in this war, the impact that they had, you know, is really quite astounding. It, it far surpasses their numbers um, uh, in terms of uh, those who, who were actively engaged in the war. And um, I, I think, Enslaved women changed the calculus 
for the Confederacy and for the federal government. And I know that there are many of my colleagues who would say, what, what are you, what are you saying? But I think um, uh, I'm not saying that they were the reason their actions led to victory on one side or defeat on the other, but that their actions led both sides to consider them. And ultimately their actions did have an impact on which side won. Yes, and these union officers, um, even some who professed abolitionist sympathies, were quick to take advantage of refugee women uh, who came behind the lines. There are many cases of um, them promising these women wages for the first time in their life. They would work and receive some kind of modest compensation in return, and then reneging on that promise, um, not granting wages. Uh, you think of somebody like um, General Sherman, who through, in his march through Georgia attracted uh, many, many hundreds of uh, enslaved women and children who seized their freedom by um, marching along with him. And then um, they came to the coast and he wasn't sure uh, what to do with them. And so that was the beginning of a very temporary um, effort to give some formerly enslaved people their land. But um, yeah, throughout the war, I think you see um, uh, these enslaved women trying to pursue their own freedom. And as you point out, changing the calculus of the war uh, in the process. Uh, so yeah, uh, fascinating story. We should um, keep in mind that some of their menfolk had uh, joined the Union Army. Others had been impressed into service by the Confederates for fatigue duty. So it really is a story, I think, of the separation of uh, Black families. Oh. Yeah, I, I think you're, you know, you're, you're exactly right on the, the story of Sherman, which, you know, you, you've done such a good job of talking about in your book on Savannah. But, um, it's a good example of the federal government and the um, union commanders having to come to terms with these women, you know, that representatives of the federal government will go down to Savannah, as you know, to meet with Sherman and say, look, guy, you know, like we, we are winning this war and we're winning it in part with the support of black soldiers and we cannot um, allow you to let your commanders turn them back or cut the bridges behind them. Um, and so I see this issue as one that um, surfaces you know, really begins to surface in 1862, but, but takes off in 63. And by the time we get to Savannah, uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Black people are not going to stay put. And that's uh, uh, very clear. And one other point, I, you know, you, you raised the point about the wages that enslaved women um, were supposed to get often and did not get on these plantations. Um, and one of the things I talk about in the book uh, is that enslaved women who worked on these plantations also had their wages taxed. So the government took out taxes um, uh, ostensibly uh, to use the funds to support uh, black people who were not able to support themselves people who were disabled or who were orphaned or elderly or, you know, and um, in those funds uh, uh, were used not only to support um, uh, the disabled and so forth, they were also used to pay uh, doctors who um, worked in the Freedmen's Hospitals and there was a great deal of that money uh, left over when the war ended and you know I tried to trace some of that my money. Well we've mentioned the union officers I just wanted um, to turn out to northern white women and um, you know as you point out some were working in um, factories during the war 
uh, I think you estimate a thousand northern black and white women volunteered to go south as teachers, nurses, missionaries during the war and um, many more after the war as well. But uh, one point I wanted you to focus on, and that is the northern white women who went south, uh, and some of them were uh, officers' wives, and others were the wives of uh, cotton agents, for instance, on the South Carolina Sea Islands, who pursued what you called a fantasy life in the south. <laughs> um, and I thought really fascinating that these are women who have come from the north, maybe from modest households, maybe not, but find themselves in a position to kind of commandeer um, Black women as workers, as household laborers, as cooks, as cleaners, as childcare workers. And, and they're delighted um, to be able to do that. And in that sense, they're very similar to their Southern counterparts, right? They're looking for someone else to do this drudge work of the household. Yeah. So I, I wondered what, you know, Northern and white women had much more in common than sometimes we, well, we I think. think. I think Northern white women um, would not have said um, in 1860 or 61, but I have something in common with planter women. Uh, um, but it's also very much the case that they are, products of the world in which they live. And that the, the plantation as a sort of romantic, beautiful um, uh, space of um, um, gentility, that permeated the nation. It wasn't a, a notion limited to the South. You know, when, we, when we keep in mind that Northerners and Southerners were on good terms, they vacationed together. Um, just as Northerners, I mean, Southerners went north to vacation, Northerners went south to vacation. And so I, I looked at some of those people who came south just to vacation. And then I, it made it easier to understand um, women who came as the wives of, of soldiers or officers or the wives of agents or as missionaries on their own um, account how they could be seduced and were seduced by the mythical plantation. And once they're there and they see it in real time, um, it's, it seems to be easy to imagine themselves as a, um, a plantation, quote unquote, mistress. <laughs> uh, right. uh, so they, they take to commandeering uh, black women and children to work for them with with ease, and there there's I I didn't run across one account in which uh, someone expressed discomfort in doing this, um, but they expressed delight in uh, living in a plantation household and their letters back home to parents and friends and so forth. So I I think um, we should not be surprised. Um, given the fact that um, uh, the plantation, not as a, a space of work and violence, but the plantation as a site of beauty had um, great retail value um, in the North as well. And, you know, even today, I mean, people want to have their weddings at plantation. So there's something about that that made it easy for Northern white women who came South to like, take up that role in that particular space and imagine themselves um, as the woman of the plantation mansion. Yes, these women, um, these white women seem to be victims of ideologies of race as well as ideologies of class. Um, you note of Elizabeth Fisk in Memphis, and I, again, I think she was an officer's wife. Um, in, he was stationed in Memphis during the war. Uh, and you say, she did not see the Black women and children around her as people in any way like herself. Uh, and that's a, that's a pretty remarkable statement, um, which suggests that really there's very little effort 
on the part of these white women to connect, to understand the, um, the suffering, the tragedy that was uh, bondage and the, uh, rather just to see them as a kind of a people wholly different from themselves. So um, that really spoke to that kind of estrangement, alienation, disconnection between Northern white women and uh, and the black women they encountered in the South. Yeah. It's really um, interesting because I don't think that any of these women who, white women who went South, went South thinking, oh, well, you know, I hate black people or, you know, I have racist views, but they were um, there, you know, maybe in a sort of unspoken, unconscious way. And then um, when we take into consideration also that Northern, the views of Northern, um, of white Northerners about black people were pretty ugly. Um, in the sense that most Northerners didn't think that black people could attain um, uh, the same uh, civilized level as white people. Most Northerners did not see um, a value in a college education for uh, enslaved people or formerly enslaved people. So Southerners were not, a, white Southerners were not alone in thinking that black people were inferior. And if you come to help, and, and this is true, if you look at missionaries, um, British missionaries in Africa, you, you come to help, but you bring with, your, with you a set of notions and ideas about the people you've come to help. Um, and those notions place them almost always in an inferior place, uh, inferior position. Um, and I think that was true of Northerners, um, and, and I also don't want to be blind to the, to the good that many of them did. Um, there were some uh, Northern white women who did good work, um, who were sincerely working to like teach black children and black adults. And then there were these others who were, um, you know, who would, come to be a teacher and not hold classes um, or treat the children as if they were not human beings. Yes. And so that's, um, that messiness uh, is just a part of life, a part of life at the time. And I wanted to capture that messiness because it's, it, it's important to understand how people come out at the other end. It is striking to me, um, for instance, many of the Northern white women and men who went south from Boston during the war did regard um, enslaved plantation workers as a very different kind of people than the few Black Northerners they knew. So they seem to think, these whites, that Southern Black people are destined to remain, um, you know, growers of cotton or rice, um, while they have plenty of examples in their own home city, uh, very well-educated, very distinguished uh, Black leaders, many of whom were fugitives from slavery. So it's not as if these Black leaders in the North were born in the North and, you know, acclimated to the North. And many of them were fugitives from slavery. But there, again, a disconnect there, as uh, many of these whites couldn't really. Yeah, a disconnect, really... um, exactly in the way that you state. And also, at the same time, um, this pervasive sense that even those who uh, enslaved people who ran away and you know um, were able to build free lives um, and get jobs and that even they were not really our equals. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. Is um, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, um, I wanted to um, just uh, take a few moments. The bully. Let's ask um, Allison if she has any. 
questions from the audience. If not, I have plenty of more, I have plenty more questions. We have one fairly specific question from the audience that I'll, um, it's also kind of long, so I'll synthesize it for you. So this person is asking about the um, different fairs that were held for the sanitary commissions. Um, and you know, there were committees of men and as well as ladies committees. And he's asking you know, what the role of the ladies committees were in, in these various initiatives. So the sanitary fairs were immensely important. Um, in raising money to support soldiers and, um, uh, you know, women by the thousands, you know, knit socks and they, um, they grew things and they made things to sell to support soldiers. I mean, what the federal government could provide was always, uh, well, ne was never enough, right? And then when you consider that some soldiers, if they came from wealthy families, their parents could send them more food. But if, you know, the vast majority of soldiers don't come from those kinds of families. And so what I found, and I didn't do a lot on sanitary affairs because other historians had already done such a great job um, in talking about their importance to um, the Union war effort, and also their importance as a space for women to build leadership skills, right? Um, and managing and um, uh, how to, how to bring themselves together, how to organize, and then how to uh, uh, make um, alliances with the right person in the federal government or the right person in the army to get their supplies from here to there. Um, so um, in general, uh, yes, uh, immensely important. Um, and um, uh, as I said, you know, I didn't give them as much attention in my book as they deserve because other people, other scholars had done such a wonderful job writing about them. Thank you. Um, I had one question and then you know, I'll pass it back to Jackie's question. So uh, you've talked a lot about the experience of enslaved women in the South who are working on plantations. And um, you know, we you know, try and talk about enslavement in New England and, and Concord as well. So I was wondering if you came across any stories of experiences of enslaved women who were in New England or in the North um, during the Civil War. I did not, um, <laughs> which is not to say they don't exist, but I did not. Um, and I, you know, to my, um, I must say I wasn't looking hard either. Um, I, I think, uh, as I say um, in the book, and I've said many times since um, it was published, we still need a really good history of Northern Black women in the war. Right, yeah, I know that before the war in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, you know, if a wealthy slaveholder brought his uh, enslaved workers with, the, with him, they could become free. Uh, in Boston, there were several cases of um, abolitionists who wanted to facilitate that process and took a case before a judge. And then the, you know, the woman was brought before the judge. And in some cases, she said she wanted to remain with her master or her mistress. And uh, presumably, so she could stay with her family and return to her family. Uh, but the white abolitionists couldn't always understand this impulse, and they were they were pretty horrified when um, these women decided not to take them up on their offer for for freedom. So it was a complicated, I think it was a complicated story there. And those stories, Jack, which I assume you're going to be telling in your forthcoming book, um, those stories have not been told. Um, right, right, and there were. Um, I found an example of a, a Southern family that uh, came to Boston. They brought their enslaved worker with her, with them. Her name was Charity Green. And, um, and she worked for them for, I think, 20 years and received no pay. She um, lived in their household. Um, she, they, she wasn't called an, a slave, but uh, she might as well have been. And then when she was too old to work, they 
uh, sent her to what was called the Aid, Home for Aged Colored Women in Boston so that she could be taken care of by um, a, a charity, basically. So, um, yeah, so slavery in some form certainly did exist in Boston uh, during this period. Well, um, a couple of uh, things here I wanted to to say, um, the bully, you conclude by noting that when white men went to war, they inadvertently put women in the public sphere. Um, so how do we square that fact with the tendency of many historians of the Civil War to ignore women altogether and focus on the battlefront and a narrow definition of politics? And I ask this knowing, of course, that there has been good work done on women during the Civil War, and yet you can still, you know, read histories that marginalize women altogether, if not ignore them altogether. So um, I don't know, is it the lore of the battlefield or, because uh, it's not a complete or accurate view of the Civil War, right? If you're going to leave women out. Well, I, I think it is the lure of the battlefield, but it's, it's, that lure is grounded in something, right? It's grounded in uh, a, a belief that, um, Wars are, in essence, about war. Wars are, in essence, about men and battlefields, and um, and women reside on the periphery. Um, and I, I'm sympathetic to some extent in the in the in the sense that what men do as soldiers and officers is vitally important, right? Um, but I'm also uh, of the, the mind that what women do has a tremendous impact on how men act, how they serve, whether or not they desert, whether or not they are depressed and don't, you know, as a result, they, they're not as um, fully in the moment of warfare as they could be. Um, men who go to war and leave families behind inevitably think about their families that they love and left behind. So you can write a, a history of the Battle uh, of Antietam, or you can write a history of the Battle of, at Gettysburg um, without mentioning women. Um, but, but we should be very careful to say this is a strictly military battlefield story. Um, and if, if, if we want to have a, a more inclusive story of the war that includes battles and social life, then that's a different, um, a, a different thing. Right, and even immediately after the battle or during the battle, women were binding the wounds of some of these men. So they, they are playing that role too in terms of the war effort. You think about the women, um, the Northern women who were on the transport um, boats, you know, uh, taking care of soldiers, Northern and Southern women who were in the hospitals. Um, you can say if you want to get rid of them, well, those are domestic duties that they're continuing to perform. Nothing new here to see but I think there is something new to see. Right. You also note at the end, quote, with the defeat of the Confederate South's bid for independence, slavery was destroyed, but the meaning of freedom, nation, and home remained contested, and the fight for free homes and full citizenship continued. Um, how would you assess the Civil War in the long view? Uh, what it accomplished, what it didn't accomplish, what are the issues we're still grappling with today that the war did not resolve? Do you want to just kind of give us a that's it your long view? <laughs> I don't know if I can, but you know, I think um, what I would say um, emphatically is that the war destroyed slavery. Now we can talk about um, modern slavery, and we can talk about the very difficult lives that um, Black people had um, after the war, but the war ended slavery. Um, and that um, fact 
was never sort of accepted by all. I mean, in, in the sense that people accepted that the war ended slavery, but not that the, the place of black people in America needed to drastically change. Um, I think the Civil War remains with us, um, that many of the battles that we fight today, um, we, we, we try to situate, some people try to situate as a legacy of the war, when in fact, many of them are not legacies of the war, but legacies of a, of a different moment and a different problem. Um, not everything can be a legacy of the Civil War, because if it is, then what we've done since is, you know, we can we can exonerate all of you know all of it by saying, well, it didn't matter that um, we had disfranchisement, or it didn't matter that we had Jim Crow, because that was just a reflection of a legacy, as opposed to being a reflection of that moment and what people at that moment desired um, to happen. Uh, so I. I I'm not very, um, um, I guess, interested in fighting the Civil War today. I'm more interested in how we today um, take some lessons from the war about, you know, living together as human beings and 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 having a world or a nation in which everyone can have a free home. I mean, that to me is incredibly important and, and we can debate what that means. Um, but I think part of the essence of our democracy is a free home. Um, so I'll just stop there. I have two minutes left, but um, I have to ask you, your answer will have to be brief. <laughs> But, you know, it's such a wonderful um, example of archival research, Simolia, this book. And I wondered if there was one moment where you were pouring over those manuscripts and, you know, I can't imagine how many pages you had to plow through to get these wonderful stories and these nuggets. But was there any one moment where you said, oh, I'm not expecting this or wow, or this definitely goes in the book or what? does any mo is there, there a moment this? There were, many, there were many such moments. Oh. One that comes to mind um, right away is um, reading about poor white women who were trying to get corn um, mm -hmm. um, because they were starving and wealthy white women accusing them to be, uh, to be in effect welfare queens. They said, well, these women oh. don't really need corn. They're just getting the free corn. They're selling it before they go back home. Um, their husbands, they give the money over to their husbands as soon as they get it. So it's just it's a surreal uh, a moment. And I thought this can't be, but so that was one of those. I, yeah. Yeah. Right. Amazing. Um, well, and thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Again, congratulations on the book. <laughs> it's great. And um, yeah, come to the museum sometime, the bully. Uh, um, we'll show you, yeah, we'll show you around. It'd be wonderful. Yeah. Now that I know you're there too, that's even yes. more. Yes. <laughs> I'm right around the corner, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Oh, thank you. The thank you both so much for participating in the program. And thank you to everyone who's watching. We do encourage you to pick up the Bolia's new book. Um, the Women's Fight, Civil War Battles for Home, Freedom, and Nation. Um, I hope this conversation piqued your interest and you want to read more. So thank you all for tuning in and thank you to you both. It's been really incredible to hear two such um, outstanding historians just have a conversation for an hour and really speak.